Shalom. This week we are reading Parshat Chaye Sarah, the Torah portion beginning with the verse, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 23. There are really only two major concepts in our Torah portion. The death of Sarah and Avraham's procurement of Marat HaMachpelah, the double cave in Hebron as a burial place, and the mission Avraham entrusted to his servant Eliezer to find a wife for Yitzchak, and ultimately Rivka's marriage to Isaac, to Yitzchak. But a major theme that emerges from these things is the concept of the true significance of the life cycle and particularly the true meaning of old age, according to Torah, and the perpetuation of the generations. How do we feel about old age? How do you feel about it? Some people celebrate it. And some people, maybe, who face its onset, cringe at the thought and do everything in their power to disguise it or outright deny it. This parsha is called Chaye Sarah, which literally means the life of Sarah. That's the name of this portion of the Torah. Yet with these verses, we are introduced to her death. In fact, the parsha has nothing at all to do with her life. It's all about her death. Here's how the parsha begins. We begin reading. And the life of Sarah was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Avraham came to eulogize Sarah, to cry over Sarah and to eulogize her. And Avraham arose from before his dead, and he spoke to the sons of Chet, saying, I am a stranger and an inhabitant with you. Give me a burial property with you, so that I may bury my dead from before me. You know, there's an important and really fascinating idea, a principle, in Torah study that the first time something is mentioned in the Torah is the main teaching on this subject, on this thing, from where we derive our deepest understanding about it. All its secrets are found in the very first appearance, the very first mention of a concept. Now, there are a number of such precedents, such first-time mentions in this week's Torah portion. Now, obviously, throughout history, until this point, Many people have passed away before this moment. Many people have died before Sarah. But do you realize, in going through all the Torah portions until this point, that Sarah is the first person whose death is recorded in this manner? She's the first person whose grave was purchased and whose burial is recorded. Surely everyone else was also buried, but why is there no mention of that? Or more specifically, why, yes, is Sarah's burial mentioned, singled out? For that matter, Sarah is the first person of whom the Torah bothers to record who was cried over by their spouse, and the first person eulogized. This can't all just be because of the singular closeness of Avraham and Sarah, what a good couple they were, and in fact, together and separately they stand as archetypes for all humanity. That's all true, but beside the point. Something else at work here, which is also instructive, in our understanding of why this is called Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, even though the topic is her death. See, death has no meaning if life has no meaning. But if a life is lived to its fullest, as exemplified by Sarah, then that death is significant. It's the life that counts, and only the life that counts. Hence, the life of Sarah, not the death. Thus, these details of the reporting of the death of Sarah bear witness and the impact of her life. And there's another first as well. And that, that one is that Avraham, our father, you listen carefully, is the first person to whom is ascribed old age. But this is a rather enigmatic and at first glance somewhat perplexing lesson of our sages. Here's how it works. Chapter 24, verse 1. After he has purchased and prepared the double cave in Hebron and buried Sarah, as Abraham prepares to send his servant on the important mission of finding a wife for his son Isaac, the verse informs us, 24.1, Now, Abraham was old, well on in years, and Hashem had blessed Abraham with everything. Now, speaking of firsts, the Midrash states as follows, and I quote, Until Abraham, there was no such thing as old age. It says, 
if a person wanted to have a conversation with Avraham, he would find himself talking with Yitzchak. If a person wanted to talk with Yitzchak, he would find himself conversing with Avraham because they looked the same. Avraham came and prayed Hashem's mercy that there should be old age. As it states, and Avraham was old, advanced in days. That's what they said. Now you know that the teachings of our sages are so deep and they are they are a poetic vehicle to understand a deep concept. Now, why is this perplexing? Because it doesn't seem to be accurate, because old age has most certainly been mentioned in the Torah prior to this verse. Regarding the citizens of, citizens of Sodom, for example, it states, when they had not yet retired and the people of the city, the people of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, the entire populace from every end of the city. Regarding the daughters of Lot, the verse states, and the elder said to the younger, our father is old, and there is no man on earth to come upon us, as is the custom of all the earth. And even regarding Avraham himself, Sarai said of her husband, then called Avram, and Sarah laughed within her, saying, within herself, saying, After I have become worn out, will I have smooth flesh, and also my master is old? And regarding both Avraham and Sarah, the verse states no less than this. Now Avraham and Sarah were old, coming on in years. Sarah had ceased to have the way of women. So I ask, regarding this enigmatic Midrashic, te Midrashic teaching, that Avraham, as it were, introduced old age, what is so special about this verse? And what is the meaning of this teaching that's connected to Avraham's prayer for Hashem's mercy, that there should be old age? See, something there is about Avraham specifically, and old age, just as he made his mark in the world with his attribute of chesed, of loving kindness, so too, something about old age is his. Now obviously, just as people had passed away before Sarah, people also grew old before Avraham. Yet the sages are teaching us that Avraham prayed for, asked mercy for, an institutionalized, recognizable old age. That's this idea about the converse, mixed up confusion of the conversations. Right, Avraham looked like Yitzchak. Obviously, this isn't about old age in its simple understanding of many years, what was already in the world. But what zikna, right, the word for old age, what it, what it really represents is old age that is acquired, that is recognizable by white hair. What does it represent? Because that was not in the world, and hence the confused conversations. And for this, Avraham interceded for Hashem's mercy, for old age to be recognized. And here's what the great Maharal explains. The Torah's idea of old age is identified with a person who has acquired understanding and wisdom. And he says, as physical strength wanes, mental capacity increases. But until Avraham's time, the generations were missing wisdom. Why? Because they did not recognize the Creator. And that recognition is the true source of wisdom. And therefore, their understanding and intelligence was suspended in a type of immature state. And therefore, although people certainly grew old, they did not achieve zikna, old age, the crown, if you would, of old age. But Avraham's mission was concerned with bringing the world to recognize the Creator and thus to be free from the constraints of mental immaturity and rise to the level of true and lasting intelligence, as represented by the perfection of old age. Avraham saw to it that the world should get to that level of intelligence, and, and with it comes age. Thus, it's Avraham, through his dissemination of knowledge of the Creator to the world, and it was his prayer that this should be lasting, this knowledge, it should be foundational for all time, for all humanity. And as illustrated by the portrayal of the mixed-up conversation in the words of our sages, he asked that this should be a visible distinction, zikna, old age, that the appearance of young and old should not be the same, so that it would be clear that with the maturity of intellect, which comes from a life of seeking godliness in the world, which is the purview of every person following Abraham's tradition, that, that it would be clear with this maturity of intellect and the dissipation of doubt that a mark has been made, that now there's a sign that I've been here, look at me, I've been around, is the idea of, of this old age, and if you will, this has made a difference. So Avraham's legacy is that knowledge of Hashem should be established and passed down, 
as a legacy in humanity from generation to generation. And that's what it means that he was the innovator of old age. And what about Sarah's legacy? After all, this is Parshat Chaye Sarah. We mentioned that they were a very close couple and they worked together in bringing people to Hashem. And our sages have clearly taught that Sarah was a greater prophet than Avraham, that's mentioned in a number of places. And the two subjects of our Parsha, the death of Sarah and the union of Yitzchak and Rivka, are really one and the same, because it's all about continuation of the legacy. After the passing of Sarah, time comes to search for a match for Yitzchak. In the meantime, Sarah's tent is not in use. Yitzchak had such profound respect and honor for his mother and her level of righteousness that he would not have her tent occupied, feeling that no other woman should use it. Now, on the verse in chapter 24, verse 67, and Isaac brought, brought her to the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted for the loss of his mother. Regarding these words, the great Nachmanides instructs us that Yitzchak had been in deep and inconsolable mourning for his mother. But when Rivka was brought to him, he loved her and was consoled. Now, on the one hand, he felt that Sarah's loss was inconsolable, and on the other hand, he didn't, seem, was, he didn't deem it proper that any woman could approach her tent. Our sages teach through this verse's emphasis that Yitzchak specifically brought Rivka to his mother's tent. They teach this speaks not only of Rivka's special qualities, but of what made the tent so special. So open up your heart. In the deepest way, this is an amazing idea. Our sages teach that all the days that Sarah was alive, there were four unique things about her tent. And this is the description. There was a candle burning from every Erev Shabbat to every Erev Shabbat. That is all week long from Sabbath Eve to Sabbath Eve. That the doors were wide open to offer hospitality. That a cloud was fixed, tied over the tent, literally attached to the tent. And that blessing was abundantly found in the dough. And when Sarah died, these manifestations ceased. Now, the candle from Sabbath to Sabbath represented the spiritual presence in the house. The open doors, the all-important attribute of hospitality. The cloud, the Shekhinah itself, the divine presence that was present in the home. And the direct connection to God. And the dough, the idea of blessing found in the dough is that all of God's blessings can be manifest in our physical life because dough made from the grain of the land of Israel requires challah, which is a separation, to be taken, similar to the priestly and Levitical tithes taken from the fruit of the land of Israel. When we take a small amount from that which we have prepared and raise it up for Hashem, then the entire dough becomes a conduit for blessing as we open up an opening to receive all of Hashem's heavenly blessing and it's all in the merit of the woman of the house, the woman of valor. Now put yourself in Yitzchak's place. Avraham sent Eliezer to find a wife for his son Yitzchak in deep mourning, Yitzchak in deep mourning for three years for his mother. Yitzchak is waiting to see if indeed the right woman will come. And this is his prayer, and this is indeed what he was praying for at the site that was to come, the place of the holy temple. As we find, as he is awaiting her arrival, we find in chapter 24, and Isaac went forth to pray in the field towards evening. The field is none other than Har Habayit, the place of the Holy Temple. He lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, camels were approaching. This is the caravan conveying Rivka. Eliezer arrives, right? And he most certainly recounts to Yitzchak all that had transpired at the well with the camels, everything that we read about here in the Parsha, right? The test. But even though Eliezer, who was Avraham's faithful servant, certainly knew quite well what kind of home Yitzchak had been raised in. He, Eliezer was aware indeed of Sarah's preeminence, of her high spiritual, of the manifestations in her tent. Yet Eliezer, upon his mission, as, as you can read, didn't check for or test most of these attributes that Yitzchak would be concerned with that he saw in his mother. In fact, in the story of Eliezer's confrontation with Rivka, we don't find any hint that this woman came from a home where the Shekhinah, the divine presence, was present as it was manifest by the cloud over Sarah's tent. Neither spiritual abundance or even the blessing in the dough. There was only one thing that was made amply clear, and that is that Rivka was a true woman of kindness. We read these verses about how he asked for some water, let me sip 
if you please, a little water from your jug. And she said, drink, my master. And quickly she lowered her jug to her hand and gave him to drink. When she finished giving him to drink, she said, I will draw water even for your camels until they have finished drinking. Look it up on Wikipedia. Do you have any idea how long it takes for camels to drink? Do you have any idea how long camels that have been wandering in the desert for a long time will drink? And she says, I'm going to stay there and give them all to drink until they have finished. No wonder he was astonished. It says the man was astonished at her, reflecting silent to know whether Hashem had made his journey successful or not. And there is so much in this one small group of verses regarding the attribute of chesed, of kindness, of Rivka. With Rivka's arrival, our sages teach, Sarah's tent, as it were, came back to life. Sages tell us that these four things returned to the tent when Rivka came. And thus, Yitzchak was consoled as we read, and he realized that she indeed is an example of his mother's archetype. And this is the true meaning of the words. In verse 67, And Isaac brought her to the tent of Sarah his mother and took Rebekah, she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted for the loss of his mother. As Rivka became as Sarah, these manifestations that had been missing since Sarah left now returned to the tent. In other words, Rivka demonstrated the same attributes as Sarah, which were manifest as these things. She became like her after her fashion. It's so all the while that Sarah was alive, a candle in her tent burned from Sabbath Eve to Sabbath Eve. A blessing was found in the dough, and a cloud was affixed to the tent, and the doors were wide open. And when she passed away, these manifestations ceased, and when they reappeared with Rivka, because with her arrival, a circle was closed in Avraham's household. It was demonstrably clear that the match between Yitzchak and Rivka was indeed made in heaven. But what do we see from all of this? That it's only the chesed that counts. That was the, that was the only important factor in Eliezer's determination that this is the woman. That was the sign from heaven, Rivka's at attribute of loving kindness. And so for all of us to understand something great from this, it's on account of Rivka's attribute of kindness, literally, that the Shekhinah returned to the tent. This is the legacy for all generations, that which was bequeathed to us all by Avraham. The knowledge of God that brings intellectual maturity has an acid test in addition to white hair. Just as Avraham and Sarah changed the world for all time through acts of loving kindness, just as Rivka followed suit and took up her role and thus closed the circle, so too, even today, the Divine Presence, the Shekhinah, is manifest on all those who seek out and pursue acts of loving kindness, the proof positive of the acquisition of true wisdom.